And you're listening to Radio France International, the time coming up to 49 minutes past the hour. Time now for our monthly rendezvous with writers from the Africa Report. And today I'm joined by Marshall Van Valen. I wanted to look at two stories today uh, in the Africa Report. The first one by Crystal Orderson in South Africa, and she is looking about the issue of land reform under new President Cyril Ramaphosa. I was surprised to learn that white farmers still own almost 75% of South Africa's agricultural land. And of course, the economic freedom fighters, black first, land first, a number of groups are pushing this up the political agenda. It hasn't until recently been high on the African National Congress agenda. Why is that and why has it moved up the agenda? Um, well, there are a lot of different reasons, uh, kind of looking at the the change in leadership with Jacob Zuma having been pushed out. He was kind of seen as a very populist, grassroots uh, sort of leader. But uh, the ANC is seeing that the land issue and uh, the rural poor and unemployment are, are very important issues. But it's also like a lot of political issues that they're being kind of pushed to be much more active by the EFF, which was founded by Julius Malema, who was a former member of the the governing party and has been much more proactive on pushing kind of leftist, pro-poor, very populist uh, sort of moves. And in order to kind of cut them off at the past, uh, the ANC has been talking about this issue more and has arrived at a, a formula of uh, expropriation without compensation, which has gotten people very worried that South Africa may be heading towards a Zimbabwe sort of situation. And uh, they say, of course, that they will try to avoid that. I, I want to look at that issue of expropriation without compensation in just a moment. First of all, though, there are a number of people who are worried about expropriation and people outside South Africa might not be aware of just how much land is still managed by South Africa's seven royal families. Uh, the most uh, well-known, of course, King Goodwill Zwelithini in KwaZulu-Natal. He manages in about a third of KwaZulu-Natal and therefore is very interested in this issue of land redistribution. How will he negotiate with uh, Ramaphosa? Uh, well, that's where kind of looking at South Africa's uh, historical particularities, kind of the, the post-apartheid uh, agreements that were needed in order to get kind of the, the kingdoms on the side of the ANC and kind of accepting the, the way forward, that it's going to be very difficult. Like you see a bit of a trend of the erosion of their authority, but kind of controlling land is very lucrative and one of the, the main ways that uh, royal families maintain their importance over controlling access to land. And so with Jacob Zuma, who was a Zulu and represented a very strong kind of Zulu bent in the in the ANC, it's going to be very difficult. This will be one of the important kind of schisms in how to manage kind of the, the largest, one of the largest ethnic groups that supports the ruling party, but policies that will seem to benefit uh, kind of regular folk, but weaken traditional authorities. And so it's it hasn't yet been explained by the ANC how they hope to kind of what carrots and sticks they have in order to deal with these sorts of negotiations. But it's going to put the traditional leaders in a very difficult position. And as you were saying earlier, the ANC has more of a modern urban background and a bit less interest and respect for the traditional rulers than 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 other uh, people in South Africa? Um, well, it's quite different because you see the, you know, with the migration to the big cities, you get a lot more people who are in the cities, but you also get a lot of people who are kind of marginalized and un unemployed. You know, South Africa's unemployment rate is about a third uh, of the population. And so, you know, it it walks a, a careful line because it tries to be a very kind of forward-looking and acceptable uh 
kind of welcoming of international business and investment, but also one that at its roots was very, you know, it's a grassroots movement with uh, a huge number, you know, it's got more members than any other party in South Africa. And it represents, you know, Johannesburg to, you know, rural burgs in the in the countryside. Now, another group mentioned in Crystal Audison's article who are keen to benefit if there is land redistribution are women who say that they are very misrepresented, very underrepresented. Give us an idea of some of the movement on that front. Um, well, you still have, you know, South Africa is one of the, it is seen as the most developed economy in with a very progressive constitution, but still in the countryside, women uh, wanting to gain access to land find that because of the the viewpoints of the traditional authorities, that it's very difficult to get land registered in your own name. And so there's still quite a lot that needs to be done. You know, giving people land immediately isn't going to resolve everyone's issues because there's so many kind of inter intertwined um, issues to be resolved. But kind of getting women trained and supported and, you know, uh, finance in order to to do farming. You know, a lot of studies have shown that uh, banks tend to lend to men. And so there are many different levels on access to land and starting up a business, in which South Africa has a lot of uh, progress to make. Now, you mentioned earlier that the big example to avoid for South Africa is Zimbabwe, where it's generally agreed that land redistribution was badly managed. Nevertheless, they are talking about uh, expropriation without compensation. How will South Africa avoid the pitfalls which led to Zimbabwe, uh, the, the, the farming industry in many ways collapsing? Uh, well, that's the issue that people point out to, that it's not an issue, that not a problem that can be resolved in one day. And that taking into account all of the various stakeholders, like South Africa has a very big commercial agriculture industry, and they've wanted to get involved in trying to help setting up uh, training for new farmers and things like that. And many people across the spectrum complain that the state really isn't playing that role that it needs to in order to to join people up. And, you know, they say that they want to avoid uh, expropriation without uh, compensation. But the state's been extremely slow. There are hundreds of thousands of land restitution claims uh, that have come up recently, and they just don't have the administrative capacity to deal with all of these things. And that's where the real challenge comes in that, you know, people want change now, uh, whether it's, you know, there was the Phoebe's Must Fall movement. There's a lot of grassroots activism. But to to ensure that not only, you know, the uh, people who own the land uh, don't have, you know, they don't want to hurt uh, agricultural production, which happened in Zimbabwe. You know, a lot of people got access to land, there were farm invasions, but they didn't have, you know, there weren't, aren't the rural roads and markets and all of the things that are needed to support uh, uh, improved agricultural production. And so South Africa has a lot more work getting past that slogan of expropriation without compensation in terms of making plans for things to to work in terms of finance and infrastructure and getting cooperatives organized and things like that. Having said that, the article in your The Africa Report by Crystal Audison is titled How Long Must We Be Patient? They feel they've waited, many of these people, since 1994 and that some of this work should already have been done towards uh, a, a workable land reform. I wanted to take a look as well at another very interesting article in uh, the Africa Report uh, by Nicholas Norbrook, very wide ranging, talking about some of the huge challenges faced amongst many different countries uh, on the African continent as uh, the manufacturing industries around the world uh, become smaller with artificial intelligence. There will be fewer jobs mm. for vast numbers of people and how different African countries might deal with that. Can you shed light on some of the examples in the report? Sure, sure. Well, it's a big theme uh, going forward. For example, the Africa CEO Forum, which is going to take place in Abidjan on the 26th and 27th of March, is assembling a bunch of the continent's leading businessmen uh, to discuss these issues. Uh, manufacturing, be it textiles or agro-processing, is seen as a great hope that, you know, looking at the countries of the world that have industrialized and developed, it's been through developing uh, these sorts of industries that 
employ a large amount of the the population. But there are people now saying that you need to look at uh, world trends in robots and AI to see where can Africa fit in and does is there a window of opportunity for Africa to make a great leap forward in terms of its development progress by uh, you know setting up glass manufacturing and aeronautics and automobile factories and people are kind of worried that if African countries aren't getting prepared now that that window is likely to close and that you see uh, for example you know sew bots these sewing robots in the United States that companies like Adidas are starting to set up factories that you know are largely occupied by robots doing that work and there are analysts who uh, Ethiopia is a great example of a country that's moving forward in terms of uh, leather making and shoes and clothes um, but banks worry that you know, more than two thirds of the jobs in the manufacturing sector in Ethiopia are threatened by the rise in robots in the manufacturing process. It's a challenge for economies mm -hmm. all around the world mm -hmm. and no less so, mm -hmm. of course, in Africa. Thank you very much, Marshall mm -hmm. Van Valen of the Africa Report. Always nice to talk to the people from the Africa mm -hmm. Report. Thanks. That's just about mm -hmm. it from us. We'll be back at the same time again tomorrow. Not me. Don't forget, you can write to us at parislive at rfi.fr. And until we meet again, take very good care of yourselves. Bye-bye. <laughs>